state law. And the, my co-author, who's now passed away, Kathleen Bricky, was the first person to start changing that by creating a treatise, by trying to build a curriculum around what white collar crime is. But still to this day, and I, I might be working on a piece article soon about this, it's just not well integrated into the curriculum. Similarly with torts, torts are all things like people getting hit over the head with a sack of flour. Where's the fraud? It's not often taught as an intentional tort, right? So there's like, if you think about this perspective, okay, so that, so there's that. I just want to want to throw that in um, about the mindset. It And the same thing is true. I think when you get your job, when you, the prosecutors, I think they care about this, but they're very siloed. I was just listening to a, a current federal prosecutor at one of the big um, uh, U.S. attorney's offices. And, you know, their money laundering unit is separate from their, um, separate from their Foreign Corrupt Practices Act unit. That's dumb. Well, is, is a lot of this seen as more of a regulatory agency burden as opposed to different, you know, like when we're talking about the siloing of some of these things like the SEC, is, is that kind of how they separate and compartmentalize some of these crimes? Emma, I'm so glad you said that because part of the problem is those handoffs, right, between the agency um, that has sort of civil and regulatory authority and then the Department of Justice who can prosecute. Um, and yes, I mean, I think, I think that's, that has a lot to do with how statistics get counted, right? Someone comes in, you know, when you are, when someone thinks you're engaged in um, insider trading, they're not like w- tackling you on a street corner and choking you to death, right? Right. I mean, think about, I mean, think about George Floyd. I mean, I return to this a lot, his tragic death. He was accused of, as you know, passing off a fake $20 bill. None of the bit, you know, if you look at, if you look at all the bank fraud and you look at all the people, executives involved in money laundering at some of the, you know, top banks in the world, I didn't hear any of them being put in a chokehold. So part of it is the way, yeah, we don't take, we, we, we sure as hell seem to take passing off a $20 bill so very seriously, uh, right? But we don't take, we, at the, at the, at the, at the regulatory, we, we treat it like, oh, it's just a regulatory offense. Right. When it's a wealthy person doing something involving a regulatory offense is, oh, let's try to handle this peacefully. When you're not wealthy, white, and well-connected, and you uh, take opportunities um, to kind of mess with things financially or use some kind of arbitrage, which was um, the case of, um, um, why am I doing this? Um, uh, the, the guy who was killed on the street corner when he was, he was selling loose cigarettes, um, Eric Garner. Garner. Eric Garner. Thank you. I mean, that was that was just tax arbitrage, mini fraud, right? So yes, I mean, what we call a regulatory offense is in a way a euphemism for it was done by a wealthy person who can hire fancy lawyers and settle the thing. Let's talk about the the costs of of so called white collar crime um, relative to the non white collar crime. I guess the one that's done by criminals as opposed to um, you know, white collar criminals, esteemed, right? Exactly. Criminals. Esteemed members of our society. <laughs> so as you hinted at earlier, since there's no official agency that captures white collar crime, I, I looked, you know, I've read many different treatises and articles and with the best data I was able to pull together was, um, the, the just looking at fraud types of crimes and embezzlement, um, that that accounted for anywhere between 300 and $800 billion in losses a year. And then the FBI itself does count things like um, uh, theft um, and other kinds of sort of, um, you know, theft and other sort of street type um, uh, property crimes only at 16 billion. Wow. Right? I and, mean, that's... But I just want to, you know, there is... There is a difference, I think, in people psychologically, the difference between someone directly um, taking your money. People are associated with violence and they're afraid. It's sort of like the analogy of if Donald Trump actually shot someone on Fifth Avenue, I think it would have consequences. But the fact that 300,000 um, people have died or a good portion of them needlessly, it's the same thing. The advantage white collar criminals have is they're at a distance from their theft and from their fraud. And they take property, but because they're not up close, 
there's less of an um, association of it with violence, which is, a, which is, I think, part of the problem. Right. And, and so, but let's talk about the other cost to society that you outline in the book, um, because the, um, the violence is, uh, there is violence perpetrated. It's just far more diffuse, as you say, and, um, not as sort of visible to the to the naked eye, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a in my chapter on victims, I do kind of have um, a paragraph that says that white collar um, victims come in many shapes and sizes. And you can think of it as the elderly couple um, who loses their savings in a Ponzi scheme. Right. That's like the made off type victim. It's even the small storefront that can't stay open, because if a small storefront were selling shoddy goods, you'd walk in word of mouth, you'd return it, you'd be angry, they would, they would close down. But a fly by night or some sort of big internet retailer, people won't bother as much to try to like, get their money back. Um, so there's that. Um, but there's also the unquantifiable damage that I think white collar crime does in the um, way that we stop trusting our institutions. And so I think when because I define what white collar crime to include bribery of public officials, I, I think both are um, Businesses and our a, large, a big business and big um, government institutions, um, people lose faith in them, right? So I will start with the government. I think the failure to prosecute any high-level bankers in the United States had a piece in um, the rise of Trump. And I'm not someone who says, I just want to be clear, I don't, you know, yes, um, white supremacy and racism is huge. But there's also, in addition to that, you, you can exploit People's are already, um, you know, it's same thing happened in Nazi Germany. You know, economic anxiety actually interlinks with um, with racism and scapegoating. And I think there's that, right? This lack of trust for the government, lack of trust for big business. We can just look at the vaccine issue. You know, big pharma has been in trouble quite a bit. And I talk about the Sackler family in the book, but it's not just OxyContin. You know, it's, it's other instances we've seen over the years where they've been unsafe, drugs put on the market. So the same companies, types of companies, were saying, trust them, we all need to get this vaccine. Um, and I know that to me, I can make I can make that leap, but a lot of people who are anti-vaxxers can't. They're going to believe in this idea that their kid, um, just because they read about one study that turned out to be debunked about autism, they're going to believe it's all um, unsafe. And it's like this. I, I don't know about you, Emma and Sam, but do you use actually a bank? I mean, do you have money in a bank account of some kind yes yes i'm not going to ask you for your your, your routing number <laughs> right Wait, is this but part of some type of like uh you're, you're, like this a, is like a, a long nigerian con. prince yeah you're that? trying to say, okay. oh boy just you wait no but <laughs> the thing is i have you know i actually my my savings account now is with a local bank but my credit cards are with these giant banks right and i sometimes i see the contradiction there and sometimes i say well you know but I live in capitalism too, you know, it has its flaws, right? And so I'm able to be someone who says, I'm going to just trust, I think I'm going to trust the vaccine. I'm going to go out and get a COVID vaccine. But there are a lot of people who don't trust big pharma, won't vaccinate, vaccinate their kids. We have this resurgence of the measles um, epidemic. Um, similarly, um, you know, you don't trust government because you see this, you know, this unfair justice system that not only targets um, mostly black males, right, who are, it, um, it disproportionately in prison for all kinds of things um, that they shouldn't be in there for, um, and lets the, the you know the rest of society for the most part, mostly you know white men and white women um, get some sort of special privilege. So there's already that mistrust, but then you layer onto it um, really watching people use um, white collar crime as a tool for advancement, um, and it makes people not want to pay their taxes. Right? It makes everyone not want to. You know, you see someone get away with tax evasion. You wonder, why am I this sucker paying my taxes? Right. Um, can't, you know, I, I mean, I'm the sucker paying Trump, my taxes. That's why Trump's line in the uh, 2016 primary about, you know, I don't I don't pay my taxes. That makes me smart. That's why that was actually an effective line, because people like when someone takes a, a, a wrecking ball to the system. And so. Yeah. So we have this this um, uh, the, this destruction and um, and degradation of, of 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 faith in institutions that, that that emanates out of this. We also have like a material harm insofar as, um, like you mentioned, the uh, financial crisis 
you had ongoing uh, fraud. You had like what, you know, I mean, even the government um, uh, HAMP program was in many respects a, a, you know, an opportunity for, if not fraud, um, real uh, predatory behavior by these um, loan originators and uh, holders of the of the loan. Um, and so you have millions of foreclosures in the wake of this. Nobody goes to jail. It doesn't inhibit that future behavior. You also have um, these corporate crimes that involve like poisoning people. Now, we make those civil. They tend to get addressed to the extent that they do. In, um, you know, in, in, in civil courts with major, um, uh, tort cases. But there is, at the end of the day, if I'm the CEO or I'm members of the C-suite and we've made this decision to like, you know what? This chemical, it's too expensive for us to burn it. We're just going to dump it into the river and then people die of cancer. Okay. Maybe, maybe I, I'm on the hook. Five, 10, 20, 30 years later for a billion dollars. It's going to cost me from the five billion I may have made from that product. But there, I am, I am knowingly engaging in behavior that could lead to the death or the serious illness of people. And why should I be subject just to, to a fine? Why, why shouldn't I be subject well, to some type of criminal charges? There is actually a doctrine that's underused that does apply in the environmental space and food. So these are called so, kind of social welfare regulatory offenses where there is um, the possibility of um, criminally charging. These are these are misdemeanors, but that come with um, prison sentences. So this is it's called the responsible corporate officer doctrine. And you might have seen recently the case with uh, the, the decoasters, Jack and his son, who ran um, an, a not, I guess, or maybe ironically named company called Quality Egg. Mm. And they had over the years um, sold very contaminated eggs. And they, in fact, admitted, what was interesting with them is they admitted, um, but they pleaded that they were responsible corporate officers because there was so much evidence against them. And let me just be clear, the responsible corporate officer doctrine allows for the conviction of um, those executives or those managers who have... Um, who are in proximity to the, the criminal offense, who had the um, control and the ability to stop the harm and didn't. They don't even have to have knowledge. And there has been a case where the conviction went through when the CEO did not actually have knowledge of this repeated offense. Now, with the decoasters, they admitted that they were the responsible to cor- corporate officers, they're the owners and operators of this giant egg factory farm. But what they did is the, the federal court judge sentenced them both to prison. I think it was three months each. And they appealed their prison sentence. And they were trying to, everyone was very much looking forward to overturning this to kind of eviscerate the doctrine. You might remember this is a couple of years ago in the Eighth Circuit upheld their prison sentences. So this is a really powerful doctrine. But when I had talked to every single federal prosecutor I've spoken to, former or, or past, never uses it, except the one guy I ran into who actually initiated some of these lawsuits Originally, but they're not they're not using it. They're not interested in expanding it. And I think that's really a way to go. Well, OK, so and this is a this is obviously a problem at a prosecutorial level. I mean, there is, like you say, there's there's statutory. Uh, there are arrows in that quiver. It's just that uh, rarely do we see prosecutors in this day and age. Uh, and you talk about how there was a change starting from the 70s and sort of evolving through <laughs> The Lewis Powell memo, uh, which, you know, turns up in a lot of conversations uh, about about the the um, you know, what has happened in this country over the past 50 years. Let's jump to uh, your six, I guess, um, uh, possible solutions, but we'll integrate a little bit of what is problematic here. I mean, in the past, I've, I've spoken to Jesse Eisenberg, who wrote that book, The, the Chicken Crap Club uh, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, specifically about the prosecutorial perspective on uh, the financial crisis in many respects and why there is such a reluctance for prosecutors to um, uh, all the incentives are lined up in such a way to sort of say, like, I may want to be part of your class. And so, we, you know, we, we don't do this to each other, that type of thing. Um, but let's talk about some of the uh, the the suggestions that you have. And 
uh, how possible they are, like what, what it will take to get to that. So I'm so glad you asked about that. You know, what's funny is um, James B. Stewart did the review of Big Dirty Money in the New York Times. 